Buenas tardes, buenos días. Soy Pilar Tena, directora del Instituto Cervantes de los Países Bajos. Estamos encantados de tener invitado aquí en Ámsterdam al escritor Manuel Vilas, que va a hablar con Margot Dickcraft, de, sobre todo de, la, de su novela Ordesa, que acaba de ser publicada por Podium, la editorial en neerlandés. Eh, queremos dar las gracias a Manuel por, por haberse animado a venir y estar con nosotros ahora y queremos dar las gracias a la OVA muy especialmente y también a Podium por apoyarnos en esta, en esta presentación. Eh, también va a participar eh, eh, Trigne Vermont en el, en el acto, ella es la traductora de Ordesa al neerlandés. Eh, muchísimas gracias, estamos eh, encantados de haber sacado este acto adelante en, otra, en otro formato, pero lo hemos sacado adelante y, y podemos incorporar Manu, a Manuel a la lista de escritores que nos han visitado durante estos años. Muchísimas gracias. Uh, I'll just say it in English for uh, the sake of those who don't understand Spanish. Um, we have Manuel Vilas here today. We are very happy. We want to thank him for deciding to, to make the trip uh, despite the circumstances. And uh, also I want to thank the OVA, who is our home in Amsterdam, and uh, Podium, also the, the uh, publishers of uh, Manuel Vilas in uh, the Netherlands. We are really proud of this um, event and we will also have participating Traine Vermont, who is the translator to Dutch of Ordesa, which is the novel that we're mainly going to hear about uh, this evening. Thank you so much and um, enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pilar, for your introduction. I'm very happy, uh, of course, to, to meet you, Mr. Vilas. And Bilas. this will be a multilingual uh, activity, actually, because we will be speaking English, Spanish, and Dutch. And we can understand each other thanks to our interpreter, Leticia Matamala. So wonderful that you are here as well. Um, Manuel, you are one of the most outstanding uh, Spanish writers uh, at the moment in Spain. You publish novels, uh, poetry, as well as many articles in newspapers. Uh, I have read actually only two titles. I have read Ordesa in Dutch, in the translation of Traine Vermund, and I have read Alegria in uh, French, actually, and I hope Alegria will be published as well in Dutch. I think Traine is working on that already. Of course, I know you have written much more. You are a poet as well. You have published poetry. Um, maybe you will be talking about that a little bit later in the afternoon. Uh, you have written, I read somewhere, a biography of Lou Reed, which was uh, amazing. You have published a travel book, America, and you came to the Netherlands with Baudelaire, I saw on Twitter. Are you a fan of Baudelaire? Sí. Me gusta mucho Baudelaire. Eh, eh, fue uno de los poetas eh, de mi juventud. Eh, ah, bueno, claro, he, he venido, lo has visto en Twitter. Sí, lo he visto en Twitter, sí. Me he venido a Ámsterdam con, con un libro de Baudelaire y lo subí ayer a, a Twitter, que estaba leyendo eh, el, el libro de, de Baudelaire sobre el opio. Hacía tiempo que no, no releía a Baudelaire, he de decir, ¿no? Pero sí, es uno de los poetas que, yo, que me formó a mí con 17, 18 o menos, 15, 16 años. Creo recordar que leía Baudelaire. Eh, me ha llamado la atención también que hayas hablado de Lou Riz, porque creo que Lou Riz, en, yo soy muy. Eh, he escrito sobre, un libro sobre Lou Riz, eh, era, era muy famoso en Ámsterdam. En, en, en sí. él, él era muy famoso porque yo. Cuando escribí el libro sobre Lou Riz, miré la recepción de Lou Riz en, en Europa. Lou Riz era muy, fue muy famoso en, en Italia, Francia y España, y vi que también en, en Holanda. Um, yes, uh, actually, um, you mentioned uh, Baudelaire as a poet. He was a, a favorite poet of mine uh, during my youth, and I think you read this on Twitter, right? 
Um, uh, actually, yes, I brought a book with me of Baudelaire, and yesterday I put on Twitter that I was reading about his, uh, what he said about opium. Um, and I read him when I was, I think, 15, 17 or 18 years old. Uh, he uh, educated me in, in a certain way. Um, and it attracts my attention that you mentioned Lou Reed also. I have written things about him and I know that he was very famous here in the city in Amsterdam. And during my writing, I searched what was his reception in Europe, where was he famous. And he was famous in Italy, France, uh, Spain, but also here. Now, I'm curious, of course, to know why Baudelaire ed educated you, but we will come to that later, because I want to speak first with you about Ordesa, of course. Um, for me, the, the, the heart of Ordesa is the question of um, saying goodbye, how to say goodbye to uh, your youth, to your parents, to your former life, to a time when one didn't realize that it would be over sometime, once. In Ordesa, we find ourselves in the head of a narrator uh, who, just as you, is born in Barbastro, in Weka. Who is this narrator, is my first question. Because uh, if you write I in the book, is it you personally or not? Is it a narrator whom you created, who you constructed? In other words, is it fiction or is it autobiography? <laughs> esa, esa, es, esa es la pregunta del millón de dólares. Eh, esa es la, la gran pregunta de la literatura. ¿no? Y yeah. es, eh, en el fondo, es eh, como es el amor que le tenemos a la literatura, es, está en, contenido en esa pregunta porque es una pregunta que no tiene respuesta. Yo no lo sé. Yo no sé cómo ah. responder esa pregunta, porque es un poco la gran, la gran invención de la novela desde Cervantes. ¿no? Yo soy... Eh, hay un, si hay un escritor que adoro es Cervantes, porque inventó, es, inventó esta pregunta que tú me acabas de hacer. ¿no? ¿Quién es el que habla en una novela? ¿Quién habla, quién demonios habla en una novela? Esta, yeah. esta es una, una pregunta importantísima, ¿no? El lector que lea Ordesa eh, piensa que, soy, que es un narrador autobiográfico y es verdad. Hay una cuestión innegable, que es tú, los hechos que se narran en Ordesa equivalen a los hechos que yo he vivido. Cualquiera podría hacer una investigación mínima sencillísima, una investigación muy elemental, en donde comprobaría que mi vida, mi vida real de ciudadano, está eh, inscrita o está representada en la novela. Um. Yes, well, that is really the one million dollar question, what you just asked me. And um, it's the main question in general of uh, literature, literature. Um, it's really the heart of literature. Uh, your question is there. And uh, actually, I don't have an answer. I don't know. Um, what is very important is who invented novels. I mean, from the time of Cervantes, who is a writer I really adore, um, we ask ourselves that question. Mm -hmm. Who invented it and uh, who is the narrator of a novel? Uh, it's a permanent uh, question and a very important one. I think that the readers of Ordesa would uh, like to think that the narrator, the author, is uh, really a biographic uh, narrator. And that is true. I, I cannot deny that. Um, if you look at the facts, it's the life I have lived. And if you would um, make a very small inquiry, very elemental, basic, you would find that it is based on real life, on what I've actually lived. 
Well, too bad, because I, you are here now, so I would like you to answer. If I say, if I ask a question, do you say, do I have to say you, or do I have to say the narrator? That's my question. Es, 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 es una novela autobiográfica. Ordesa es una novela autobiográfica, es, es, sin, sin ningún género de dudas. Claro, pero decir esto no significa crear una ecuación matemática. Eh, por, voy a poner un ejemplo. Mi hermano ha leído la novela. Eh, los episodios que se, eh, familiares que se narran en la novela, él los ha vivido, pero cuando leyó la novela, eh, la interpretación de esos episodios no es su interpretación. Uh -huh. Por tanto, el carácter subjetivo de la memoria es eh, casi eh, un misterio. La memoria, como cada ser humano recuerda de una manera. De todas formas, lo importante, lo importante es que yo recuerdo a mi padre y a mi madre con un inmenso amor. La novela es una novela de amor a un padre y a una madre. Uh -huh. Y esta, esta idea fundamental del amor como, como guía de la novela es la que, la, que hace, la que hace que dé igual que sea una narración autobiográfica o no lo sea. ¿no? Lo importante es el amor. Cuando uno ve amor en el mundo, da igual de dónde venga, se pone contento inmediatamente. Uh -huh. So, Ordesa is an autobiographic novel. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But having said that, uh, I also have to say it's not a mathematical equation. For example, my brother has read the, the book, the novel, and he has also presenced uh, the things I describe, the, or the episodes I describe in this novel. Uh, but reading this, he interpreted them in a very different way uh, than in the novel. I mean, it, it's not that uh, simple and his interpretation is different. So um, I think that it's really almost a mystery, the, the fact that memory is a very subjective thing and um, everyone remembers in a very different way. The important thing is that I remember my father and mother uh, with the greatest of loves. And this is a love story for my mother uh, and my father. Uh, the basic idea is, is love and it's the theme of the novel. That is what is uh, important. And it doesn't matter if you see love uh, wherever it comes from in the world, and that makes you happy. Yes, of course, that's the whole question of memory, mm -hmm. how it works. No yeah, one has yeah. ever the same uh, yeah. memories of, of yeah. brothers, yeah. fathers, yeah. sisters. Yeah. They yeah. all have their own yeah. memory. Yeah. But let's go back to the narrator, if I, yeah. if I may. Because we are in the head of this narrator. And for 157 chapters, we are with him in the head of this narrator, um, spinning around, spinning around of, in thoughts, um, living with him, this sadness, this sorry, uh, the loss, the pain, the beauty also, and the love for life. We, we witness all that. This narrator has been a teacher for 20 years. He is divorced. He has two sons, which he sees not very often. He lives in, in this um, village, Barbastro, in Huesca. Could you tell us a little bit about what kind of a region this is? Es el, el, en el norte de España, eh, en la frontera con Francia. Es un pueblo donde eh, mi pueblo, mi pueblo natal, es un pueblo de. tenía 13.000 habitantes 
cuando, cuando yo nací. Y mi padre adoraba ese pueblo. Tenía una relación eh, de gran felicidad eh, viviendo allí. Se sentía profundamente... Yo lo, claro, yo lo veía de niño. Veía el arraigo profundo que tenía mi padre eh, con el pueblo. ¿no? A mí me encantaban, a mí me gustaba mucho que mi padre y mi madre eh, me sacaran a pasear por las calles del pueblo, porque todo el mundo decía que mi padre y mi madre eran muy guapos. Entonces yo quería que, que vieran que eran mis padres. ¿no? Eh, esto por contar una anécdota de mi pueblo. Y a, a veces mi padre y mi madre no me sacaban a pasear cuando yo era niño. Y me sacaban a, me sacaba a pasear mis, mis tíos, que eran más feos que mis padres. Entonces, cuando yo iba... La, el primer recuerdo que yo tengo de la vanidad, de, de haber sentido la vanidad, es siendo niño, cuando mis padres no podían sacarme a pasear y me sacaban mis tíos por el centro del pueblo. Yo tenía ganas de, de decir a todo el mundo qué pasaba delante de mí. Es decir, estos no son mis padres, estos son mis tíos. Mis padres son mucho más guapos. Que eso, yo, yo lo sentía como una, como una afrenta que no me sacaran mis padres a pasear porque eran mucho más guapos que mis tíos. Yo creo que es el primer recuerdo que tengo de la vanidad, ¿no? del sentimiento de la vanidad. Todo, todo lo que me ha pasado en la vida está vinculado a los primeros 18 años de vida y esos primeros 18 años de vida ocurren en un pueblo como, como es Barbastro. Esto lo decía García Márquez también, decía García Márquez que, que lo universal ocurre en los sitios que se tienen como más eh, eh, absolutamente recónditos y, y, y marginales, ¿no? como un pueblo de, de Sumacondo o, un pueblo de, o cualquier lugar recóndito de Colombia o un, un sitio perdido de, de la España profunda, ¿no? Well, Barbastro is a very small village in the north of Spain, uh, near to the border uh, with France, France. I was born there, and in the period when I was born there, uh, there were 13,000 inhabitants. Um, my father adored, he loved his, his village. He was very, very happy living there. And I felt that. I, I saw my father, I saw his roots, Uh, in this village. And I very much liked to wander, to stroll with them in the streets with my father and, and mother, because they uh, were very handsome, they were very beautiful people. And I liked when people watched us and thought, you have very beautiful parents. Sometimes they couldn't take me for a walk, and uh, my aunts and, and uncles did. But I didn't like that very much. I think that was my very first memory of vanity, what it meant to be uh, vain. Uh, because I saw that my uncles, my aunts, uh, they were ugly. And I didn't want the village to think that these were my parents. I wanted to say, hey, These are not my parents, these are my uncles and, and, and aunts, and uh, they are not very, they are not as beautiful as my parents. So, um, yes, that's my very first memory of, of vanity. And um, I think everything in life is based on those very first 18 years of your life, and this is the place where I spent them, the first 18 years. It's also something that Garcia Marquez says, that uh, everything, all universal things uh, originate sometimes the most forgotten or marginalized uh, places like his Macondo, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or a, a very small village in, in the north of Spain. que uno en una novela hable de un pueblo remoto de la España profunda como Barbastro, en vez de hablar de Nueva York o de París o de Londres, pues, pues sí, eh, es como un, como un acto de desobediencia, ¿no? Moral, casi. So the fact, the fact that 
in a novel, you speak about a very small town village in the north of Spain, and you don't speak of New York, Paris, or London, could be seen as a somewhat a moral, a being de morally disobedient. Yeah, elegir, elegir un espacio para una novela ya es un acto moral, ¿no? Es decir, claro, ¿qué sentido tiene que, que un escritor que ha nacido en un pueblo de la España profunda eh, escriba de Madrid o escriba de Nueva York, ¿no? si no los conoce? ¿no? Uh -huh. Debe escribir de su, de su humilde origen eh, ciudadano. ¿no? So, choosing the place where your novel is going to take place is also a moral act. Um, what sense does it make when an author uh, that has been born, who has been born in a very small village in the north of Spain, writes about New York or another city that he doesn't know? No, this author has to write about his own humble origin. No, en, en, en Barbastro esta novela ha, ha despertado, claro, de repente todos los ciudadanos de un pueblo pequeño se quedan atónitos por salir en una novela. Eh, eso, eso es muy bonito, eso, eso, eso es muy duro, es muy... ¿Cómo? Es, es, tiene, tiene algo de redención, ¿no? De, de gente humilde que de repente aparece en una novela, ¿no? Y en ese sentido la, la, la literatura parece parece una especie de... Eh, eh, como si hiciera justicia poética, ¿no? En mm -hmm. uh, the, the people of uh, Barbastro were amazed that they were the subject of a novel. And this is very beautiful. It's almost a sort of redemption uh, of humble people that appear in a novel. It's a way of uh, literary or, or poetic justice within literature. Yeah. A, a veces pienso que mi padre me mandó a la universidad para que luego metiera en una novela a su familia y a todos sus amigos, ¿no? Es decir, es como una especie... De, yo creo, en la, creo un poco en la magia de cómo explicar esto, ¿no? Bueno, no vamos a dejarlo ahí. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think that my father sent me to university so that later on I could write a novel about his family and his friends. I believe in the magic of that fact. Yeah, there are two things that strike me in your answer. First of all, um, the search for beauty, that's what you answer, uh, you answer first. It's a search for beauty. You want to be with beautiful people. You want to have money also in the book. The, the narrator wants to have money in the book, not because of the fact of having money, because he knows that having money, being rich, will open doors to luxury, and luxury opens doors to beauty. Isn't that one of the aims of the narrator, to, to look for beauty in his life? Sí. That's my first reaction. Sí. La, 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 el narrador de Ordesa está obsesionado con, con la belleza, y porque ha visto una dimensión de la vida en donde ya la belleza es importante. Eh, yo empecé a escribir la novela cuando murió mi madre, en mayo, de, mayo del 2014. En ese momento comienzo a escribir la novela y de repente eh, empecé a... Yo, yo no creo en los fantasmas, soy normal, pero, pero de repente empecé a recordar eh, cosas que yo pensaba que no que, que había olvidado ¿no? y en esa, en esa eh, fuerza apasionada de la memoria vi, vi muchísima belleza en el acto de recordar eh, el pasado vi un, un río de belleza inagotable ¿no? de ahí que la novela eh, tenga un componente importante eh, de carácter poético. Yes, the narrator of uh, Ordesa has 
an obsession with beauty because he sees that there is a certain dimension of life uh, where beauty is very important. I started writing this novel in May 2014, uh, when my mother died. And <clears throat> I don't believe in ghosts, but I started writing and remembering things that I thought I had forgotten. And within this uh, very, uh, uh, this force that originated uh, these memories, uh, I saw uh, very much uh, beauty. Um, so memories originated uh, a, a river of beauty. And uh, this is what, what the novel contains. Hay una belleza sencilla en la novela, no, belleza humilde, en, en recuerdos del narrador. Por ejemplo, yo me acuerdo que, yo recuerdo que en mi infancia que, que mi madre, se le, en verano, se, se levantaba por la mañana y comía sandía. Y la manera con que comía la sandía, ella adoraba la fruta, la fruta en el verano. Y eso a, yo lo he heredado. Yo tengo obsesión con la sandía y el melón, son dos frutas de, del verano en España, porque mi madre veía en esa fruta una dimensión de la belleza, del buen tiempo, del verano. Y, y quiero decir que, que la belleza que hay en, en, en Ordesa es la belleza de las, no es la belleza de la Capilla Sixtina, no, no es la belleza del arte, del gran arte, de, de, no, no es una, una belleza sofisticada, es una belleza humilde uh -huh. eh, de, de, persona, de las personas que gozan de comer una fruta, de beber un vaso de agua, de tomar el sol, eh, que era lo que, lo que yo le... Yo, mi madre adoraba la belleza de la vida, pero era la belleza más eh, humilde, esa es la uh -huh. palabra. Um. So, the beauty of which I speak in Ordesa is a very simple, humble beauty. Um, for example, in summertime, my mother uh, used to eat watermelon, a fruit uh, typical of, of summertime, um, and I inherited this. I adore a fruit uh, during summertime, especially watermelon and melon. And for her, for my mother, uh, this fruit represented uh, summertime, the sun, um, and I, I, I saw this in her. So the beauty that I describe is not the beauty of the 16th chapel or uh, beauty of art or sophisticated beauty. No, it's humble beauty. It's a beauty uh, that it, is expressed by people uh, who adore to eat fruit or to drink a glass of water or who enjoy the sun. It's that type of beauty that I describe. Yes, I understand. Of course, it is, it is the beauty so, yeah. of everyday life, yeah, no, in fact. It's the, the, the beauty we all know, we all are looking for in our life, isn't it? Yeah. May I ask you to, because I would like our, our, uh, the people who are watching us also to, to get a grasp of your style, of how you write. Um, in lots of cases, the first page of a book contains a lot of themes which become essential uh, later on in the book. And I think this is the case with Ordessa also. Would you be so kind to read the first uh, page nearly, please? And then afterwards, I will ask Treine to read her Dutch translation. And then I'll have some questions about this fragment. Perfecto. Muy bien. Ojalá pudiera medirse el dolor humano con números claros y no con palabras inciertas. Ojalá hubiera una forma de saber cuánto hemos sufrido y que el dolor tuviera materia y medición. Todo hombre... Esto está muy bien escrito. ¿eh? A ver, perdonadme la, la falta de modestia. Perdonad la falta de modestia. Pero es que está muy bien escrito. ¿eh? Está muy bien escrito. 
<laughs> so I think this is very well written, and I apologize for the lack of modesty, but I have to say this is very well written. Sí. Ojalá pudiera medirse el dolor humano con números claros y no con palabras inciertas. A ver, hay una... Perdón que interrumpa la lectura. Hay una cosa que, que es importante en mi literatura, eh, que es el que, que Traines ha tenido que medir con ella, que es el... Eh, no hay ni una sola palabra en esta novela, eso es un trabajo mío, eh, que sobre o falte. O sea, está todo medido. Parece un soneto. Yo esto lo aprendí en la tradición latinoamericana. Lo aprendí de un escritor que para mí fue fundamental, que fue eh, eh, Pedro, la novela Pedro Páramo de Juan Rulfo. Yo cuando leí Pedro Páramo de Juan Rulfo dije, esta es una novela en donde todas las no se puede cambiar una palabra. No hay una palabra que pueda cambiarse. Están está todas las palabras que tienen que estar... Esto parece un soneto. Ese sentido fuerte del estilo, un sentido muy fuerte del estilo, es, es consustancial en, en Ordesa. Es decir, eh, la fuerza del estilo explica la novela. En ese sentido, claro, yo creo, en mi opinión, que la literatura, llamamos literatura a la, al poder de un estilo, a la fuerza de un estilo. Me perdón que haya interrumpido. I apologize for interrupting my reading again, um, but I think it's very important to mention uh, an aspect of my way of uh, writing literature, and it's something that Trina, Trina had to deal with, and that is the fact that every word here is thought of. Uh, there is no word less or uh, too much or too, too little. It's like a sonnet in uh, the Latin American tradition. And there is a writer and a novel that I would like to mention in this uh, sense, uh, Juan Rulfo, the author who wrote Pedro Paramo. And that is a novel that when I read it, I thought, uh, this is perfect. There is no word missing. Um, this is like a sonnet. So every word that has to be in this novel is in it. And this is the force of uh, style. I, in that sense, I think that literature is the power or the, the force of one's style. Todo hombre acaba un día u otro enfrentándose a la ingravidez de su paso por el mundo. Hay seres humanos que pueden soportarlo. Yo nunca lo soportaré, nunca lo soporté. Miraba la ciudad de Madrid y la irrealidad de sus calles y de sus casas y de sus seres humanos me llagaba por todo mi cuerpo. He sido un exceomo, no entendí la vida. Las conversaciones con otros seres humanos se volvieron aburridas, lentas, dañinas. Me dolía hablar con los demás, veía la inutilidad de todas las conversaciones humanas que han sido y serán. Veía el olvido de las conversaciones cuando éstas aún estaban presentes la caída antes de la caída, la vanidad de las conversaciones, la vanidad del que habla, la vanidad del que contesta, las vanidades pactadas para que el mundo pueda existir. Fue entonces cuando volví otra vez a pensar en mi padre, porque pensé que las conversaciones que había tenido con mi padre eran lo único que merecía la pena. Regresé a esas conversaciones a la espera de lograr un momento de descanso en mitad del desvanecimiento general de todas las cosas. Thank you very much. I know Trine is somewhere with us. I hope. Yes, I am. There I she hope. Is. Hello, Trine. Wonderful Hello. to have you. Where are you? I'm in Brussels at the moment. <laughs> so, wonderful technique we have here at the OBA. Um, Well, great that you are with us as well. Could you please read your translation in Dutch for us? I will. Manuel has raised the bar, huh? but I'll try my best. <laughs> Veel menselijk verdriet maar uit te drukken in heldere cijfers in plaats van onzekere woorden. Was er maar een manier om te weten hoeveel we hebben geleden. Wat verdriet maar materie en maat. Ieder mens wordt op een dag geconfronteerd met de gewichtloosheid van zijn verblijf op aarde. Er zijn mensen die dat verdragen. Ik zal het nooit verdragen. Ik heb het nooit verdragen. Ik keek naar Madrid en de onwerkelijkheid van zijn straten, zijn huizen, zijn mensen, sloeg wonden over mijn hele lichaam. Ik ben een man van smarten geweest. 
Ik begreep het leven niet. Gesprekken met anderen werden saai, traag, schadelijk. Het deed pijn om met andere mensen te praten. Ik zag de nutteloosheid van alle gesprekken van de mens... die al voorbij zijn of nog moeten komen. Ik zag gesprekken vergeten worden terwijl ze nog gevoerd werden. De val voor de val. De ijdelheid van gesprekken, de ijdelheid van degene die praat... de ijdelheid van degene die antwoord geeft... de ijdelheden die zo zijn afgesproken op dat de wereld kan bestaan. Toen moest ik weer aan mijn vader denken... want ik bedacht dat alleen de gesprekken die ik met hem had gehad... de moeite waard waren. Ik keerde terug naar die gesprekken, hopend op een ogenblik respijt... Terwijl alles om me heen bezig was te verdwijnen. Thank you very much, Trine. Now we have you, so I'm I'm really uh, curious to know how was it to translate Manuel uh, Villas, and how would you characterize his style, and what were the difficulties? Could you speak to us a little bit about those questions? Yeah, um, it was difficult. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think Manuel has said it. Every word is there with the reason. Um, and I also have the feeling that he uses every inch of a word's meaning. He stretches the limits of the meaning of a word. Um, then there's the poetry. There's a lot of poetry in it. Uh, sometimes it's compli- the ideas can be complicated, it's philosophical, um, but also very funny. <laughs> I laughed a lot. So I laugh a lot when I read your books, and I laugh a lot when I'm translating. Um, and um, very touching as well. And the rhythm, it's its all there, and you want to transmit all of it. So it's uh, its not an easy task, but it's a pleasant struggle. I call it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any contact directly v- during the translation? Yes. I, uh, Manuel was extremely helpful because he answered, I think, hundreds of questions I had. Um, I saw that he was very willing to help, so I, I made good use of that. <laughs> yeah, we talked a lot. We talked a lot about his ideas, about metaphors, and and I must say that helps a lot. It, it's very interesting as well, and it was. It, we had conversations really about the. I think you said that Manuel about the core of language, which is uh, which is always very interesting, of course. But that was very helpful. Yeah. How much time did you spend on the translation? Uh, more than a year, uh, on and off. I wasn't working on it full time, but I spent, I, and I really needed that time. I was lucky that podium gave me the time I needed, but it, it took a long time to strike the right tone and and to just puzzle over things over and over again. And yeah, it was a very difficult translation, but I, but I enjoyed it very, very much. So, mm. yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, you're now translating uh, Alegria. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I read it in French, so I cannot really judge um, the difference of tone. But I think there is a difference of tone uh, between the two titles, uh, or am I mistaken? Uh, no, I think there is a difference. But I think, um, well, you, I think you said it before the interview started. There's definitely a more prominent role for the living, <laughs> so that's the difference. Um, and yeah, there, I think that's the different tone as well. I think for the translation, uh, everything's new, so everything it, it, it will be equally difficult. It's it's the same style and and um, the subject matter is comparable, but you start all over again. Uh, although you're more familiar with the style, um, and I might be looking less for words uh, in the domain of deterioration and decay, and maybe more in a domain of joy and happiness, but I'm not sure about that, so uh, <laughs> we'll see. And what will be the title in Dutch? Did you s- decide on that with the publisher already? No, I don't think we know that yet. No, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know yet. So, uh, and I'm not going, going to say anything about that because it's too <laughs> delicate. <laughs> <laughs> because it has a lot of uh, implications, Alegria, is that it? it can it's be, very difficult. It's yeah. going to be one of the big difficult things i think of this translation it's uh, it's not that straightforward to translate alegria so um, i no. think at the end of the translation you can really judge what the content of that word is and what the meaning actually is uh, thank you very much Trine. maybe we will have time to come back to you later on thank okay you. Yeah. <laughs> Manuel, I'd like to come back to the, the final yeah. phrase of what, what Treine and you read. Um, it's about uh, everything which is disappearing, everything is going away, 
all that we have been living is, is, is disappearing. Your book, in a way, is about a dissolution of the past. Um, the dissolution of the past, but at the same time the construction of the past, isn't it? Isn't it that why maybe you have become a writer? Because you have this urgency in yourself to, to recreate the past. Isn't that what you're doing constantly, at least in these two books? Sí, eh, cuando, cuando murió eh, mi madre, mmm, yo me sentí culpable porque yo creo bueno, porque a donde ella iba yo no podía ir. Eh, esta, este sentimiento de culpabilidad lo, lo tienen todos los seres humanos que pierden a un ser querido y no pueden ir con él a la muerte. Tú te tienes que quedar en la vida. Tu ser querido se va a la muerte, pero tú te quedas en la vida y por tanto te sientes culpable porque no le acompañas a ese sitio al que va. Tendrías que morirte tú también. Pero eso no es ley de vida, no puedes hacerlo. La solución que yo encontré ante este sentimiento de culpabilidad fue escribir una novela que era, en este caso era construir una pequeña religión. Esto es como una especie de religión de tres personas, mi padre, mi madre y yo. Es como una Biblia personal. Entonces aquí lo que hice fue construir un templo privado para eh, que estuviéramos otra vez los tres juntos, mi padre, mi madre y yo. Yo lo hice con una idea eh, absolutamente personal. Yo, de hecho, no pensaba, pensaba que este libro no le iba a interesar a nadie. O sea, y, y ni siquiera sé por qué me lo editaron en España. ¿no? Eh, pensaba que era un libro mm, absolutamente privado. ¿no? Y la sorpresa fue cuando se publicó y, y, y en España fue un absoluto furor. ¿no? ¿Me alargo mucho? Voy a tal Sí. sí. So, yes, um, when my mother died, I felt guilty because I couldn't go to the place that she was going to. And I think this happens to everyone who loses a loved one. Uh, you cannot accompany them, you cannot go with them into death. Um, you, and that's the sense of guilt that you feel. Um, it's a law of life that you cannot go with them. And my solution to this, to this feeling of guilt, was to write a novel. And I constructed a very small religion for three people, for three persons, my mother, my father and myself. And I tried to make, or I made a, a personal Bible and I constructed a private temple to be together with my parents. Um, I think this idea, and uh, I, I didn't think this would really interest anyone. And I was amazed it was uh, published in Spain Um, because I thought it was a very personal, private book, but in Spain it became a hit. Hay, hay una cosa que yo tenía una obsesión por, por contar de mi vida, de mi infancia, que fue la, la presencia de, del coche en mi familia, del automóvil, porque yo lo viví de crío. Mi, mi padre era viajante y, y, y llegaba el domingo y, y mi padre y nos quedábamos en casa porque a donde decía mi madre que podíamos ir, mi padre decía que no, porque no había sombra para el coche. Entonces yo, de niño, veía que mi padre dejaba de ir a los sitios porque no había sombra para el coche. Y a mí eso me parecía una ley de vida, ¿no? Porque era la ley que imperaba en mi casa. Eh, eh, y hasta tal punto que cuando íbamos de vacaciones... Eh, cuando le fue bien a mi padre nos llevaba una semana de vacaciones a la playa y nos alojábamos en un, en un sitio, en un hotel que estaba a 10 minutos de la playa 
Y mi madre me, me despertaba a las 7 de la mañana y era verano y yo le decía a mi madre, pero ¿por, ¿por qué me despiertas tan pronto? Si cuando es el colegio me despiertas a las 8 y aquí que estamos de vacaciones me despiertas a las 7. Y mi madre me decía, porque tu padre tiene que dejar el coche en la sombra. Y es verdad, porque en la playa a la que íbamos había solo cuatro sombras y había que llegar muy temprano para dejar el coche en la sombra. Toda mi infancia, me, me estoy... Eh... Uh -huh. So I, I was obsessed uh, by telling uh, people of my youth, of my life, and a very important element uh, present at that time was uh, the car, my father's car. He uh, traveled for his, his work and had a car. Um, and one fixed idea of him was that the car had to be parked into a shade, into a shadow. And he didn't go places if there wasn't any shadow to park his car in. For me, that was a sort of law of life because that was a law in our house, in our home. And he took us on, on holiday once a year. We went uh, a week to, uh, to the seaside. Um, we stayed at a hotel uh, 10 minutes away from uh, the beach. And my mother used to wake me up at 7 a.m., And I asked her, why do you wake me up at 7 a.m. Uh, while when I go to school, you wake me up at 8? And her answer was, well, your father has to park the car. And uh, <laughs> there were actually four places where he could park his car in the shade. And you had to be early there uh, in order to get a place. Entonces... Yo publico la, esto, yo creía que era una disfuncionalidad de mi padre. Mi padre se le iba a la cabeza con esto. Y yo publico, pero claro, como yo estaba obsesionado también, yo de, también dejaba el coche en la sombra porque le dé el trauma. Cuando yo, yo, yo esto lo tenía que contar, lo cuento en la novela y, y a la semana de, de publicarse la novela en España, un montón de gente me dice, mi padre era como el tuyo. Mi padre tenía que dejar el coche en la sombra, si no, sufría toda la familia. Entonces yo empecé a decir, bueno, pero me quedé alucin, sorprendidísimo. Yo, España, en 1970, España era 30 millones de españoles dando vueltas por la península ibérica buscando sombra para el coche. O sea, porque es que te lo juro, o sea... No había, es la cantidad de lectores en España que me han dicho que su padre era como el mío es alucinante. Todos los padres de mi generación estaban obsesionados por dejar el coche en la sombra. Todavía no me lo puedo creer. Todavía no me lo puedo creer. Pero es así. Pero es que en otros países también. En Francia y en Italia también hay gente, o sea, la, la misma generación, dejando el coche. Había dado... ¿Qué, ¿Qué pasaba detrás de aquí? Había dado con un, en un... Había tocado una tecla universal, que es la construcción de la prosperidad de las clases medias europeas de los años 60. Y, y uno de los símbolos de esa prosperidad era el automóvil. So I thought uh, that my father was somehow dis dysfunctional with his obsession of parking the car in the shadow. And I did the same thing because uh, for me it was a trauma uh, of my childhood. But um, one week after my novel was published in Spain, I started receiving messages uh, from the readers who said, my father was exactly the same. He too wanted to park the car in the shadow and he was obsessed by it. So uh, in the 1970s, we had 30 million Spanish uh, um, families uh, or inhabitants looking for a place to park your, the car in the shadows. It's, it's amazing, it's incredible. And um, many, many readers uh, wrote to me and said, my father was exactly the same as yours. It's, it's really amazing. 
And I can almost not believe it, but it, it is that way. And Spain wasn't the only country. In France and Italy, you, we had the same phenomenon. It's the same generation. And I think here I touched a very um, universal uh, point, and that is the rise or the, the prosperity of middle class families in Europe in the 1960s. And a very important symbol of this was the car. Yes, of course, yeah. Mm. It makes me remind, um, the whole of what I read of you, it makes me remind of, uh, of Annie Arnaud, uh, who also is writing uh, in a bit like you do. She, she is also writing a whole panorama of the second half of the 20th century. And her father also bought a car and wanted it to be in the shade in France. Yeah. But I have another question, because you are speaking very kindly about your father now, and you do also, uh, well, you're very lovely, lovable with him in the book. But your mother is, is quite a different story. Um, for instance, you say about her, it's a mental degeneration caused by a political degeneration. It is um, a disastrous hurricane, your mother. It is 50 years of mismanagement. That's not very kind uh, way of speaking of your mother, and I'm not wondering, um, especially because about her, but but the, the portrait you 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 make in your book about Spain and about people in Spain is really hard. It's remarkably hard. It's quite biting, actually. Because you say, for instance, and I can quote many, many examples, Spain didn't give anything to my parents. Franco didn't, the monarchy, monarchy didn't. If we go abroad, you say about the Spanish people, we seem to be nice, but between us we put a knife in each other's ribs. It is the Spanish mystery which astonishes historians, writers and intellectuals. We kick on seeing people going down. Wow! And then it became a bestseller in Spain. <laughs> bueno, <laughs> bueno, primero, mi madre, mi madre es que era un, mi madre era un espectáculo. O sea, mi madre era, mi madre, se, los últimos años de la vida de mi madre era la, íbamos a la búsqueda de la peluquería perfecta. O sea, yo estaba, mi madre iba de peluquería en peluquería. Yo la acompañaba, buscaba la peluquería que le devolviera a la juventud. Mi madre no aceptaba el envejecimiento. Yo es que, ¿cómo es alucinar? Alucinaba con mi madre, esa expresión coloquial. Yo iba con mi madre al médico y el médico le preguntaba, señora, ¿cuántos años tiene usted? Y mi madre le decía al médico, ¿y a usted qué le importa? Eso le decía mi madre al médico. Yo estaba allí con ella y digo, joder. ¿Qué hago ahora yo? ¿Qué le digo yo al médico? ¿Y a usted qué le importa? O sea, dice, ¿has visto? Me ha preguntado que cuántos años tengo, pero que me importará a mí cuántos años tiene su madre. <risa> era una mujer, era un triunfo de la vida, no tenía leyes de ninguna naturaleza. No, tampoco, yo, yo, a mí me pareció, todo lo que hacía mi madre me parecía de esencia divina. Yo adoraba a mi madre. Es verdad que me, me volvía medio loco porque también le dio por gastarse cremas, o sea, le dio por... A, a mi hermano y a mí nos, casi nos arruina. Iba a una tienda y se compraba, se compraba las cremas, esa, cremas de 300 euros antienvejecimiento. Y un día mi hermano y yo le dijimos, mamá, es que no te puedes comprar una crema de 50 euros, tienen que ser cremas de 300 euros las que te compres, porque las pagamos mi hermano y yo. Uh -huh. Y mi madre me decía, pero bueno, no podéis ni comprarme esto. Entonces, ¿para qué os he sacado yo? ¿Para qué os he sacado yo adelante? ¿Pero qué clase de pobres sois vosotros? Era una punky total. ¿Cómo no escribir una novela teniendo una madre así? Mi madre, luego mi madre, no, no, mi madre no te podía fiar de nada de lo que te contaba, porque mi madre lo cambiaba. Yo, yo, yo acabé siendo un narrador caótico porque mi madre era una narradora caótica. Mi madre no sabíamos... Cuando queríamos, le preguntábamos a mi hermano y yo qué había hecho con no sé qué, las versiones que nos daba eran 50 versiones, nunca sabíamos qué había pasado. Mi madre era así. Uh -huh. Yo entonces, cuando... En vida de mi madre yo sufría mucho porque me volvía medio loco, 
pero cuando se murió dije, coño, pero si mi madre era una artista, esto es un triunfo de la vida, era una, una auténtica artista de la clase media española. Claro que no sabía ni, ni dónde vivía. No sabía ni que había una monarquía, ni que hubo Franco, ni que nada. Era, vivía, ella era una mujer primitiva, era un triunfo de la vida contra cualquier organización política. Ella creía solo en el mar, el buen tiempo, la luz, el sol, los árboles. Toda la organización, toda estructura política que había en España ni le interesaba, ni la, ni la veía, ni la sabía, ni la entendía. Okay. Esto podía parecer ignorancia política, pero a mí al final me pareció un triunfo de la vida. Uh -huh. Mi madre no sabía... Maybe we should, que se llamaba Barbastro, pueblo en el que vivía. Otherwise we will lose you. <ríe> es que me, 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 me apasiona. Sí, este sí, tema. sí. Me, me voy, porque es que me acuerdo de mi madre y me apasiona porque mi madre es que era... Mi padre cuando quería joderme a mí, perdón por la expresión, que mi padre, yo quería parecerme a mi padre, mi padre me decía, es que tú eres como tu madre. <ríe> Realmente yo he salido a mi madre. Yo también soy un, un anarquista. Un anarquista literario, como sea. So, my mother was a real show. Um, she was, uh, for example, in, during the last years of her life, she was looking for the perfect uh, um, hair, hair cut. Uh, hair, um, Uh, cut. So um, she made me go with her to several salons and I would accompany her uh, in search of the, perf the people who could give her the perfect haircut. Um, she wanted to regain her youth and she didn't accept old age. Um, for example, I took her to the doctor and the doctor asked her uh, how many how many years or how, how old are you? And my mother said, um, and what is it to you how old I am? And she said to me, uh, listen to him. He, he asked me um, after my age. Uh, I don't ask him how old his mother is. And in the meantime, I was trying to be composed and uh, ask myself, oh my God, what am I going to tell this doctor? Um, I think my mother was a victory of life and she didn't abide by any law. Um, everything that um, my mother uh, did was uh, invented by her and when she was alive, that sometimes drove me a bit mad, um, but I adored her. Another obsession of her was with uh, creams, with uh, anti-aging creams. And uh, she almost drove me and my brother to uh, ruin because she used to buy uh, creams that costed 300 euros. My brother and I asked, uh, why can it, can't you buy something that costs 50 euros and not 300? Because we paid for them. And then she said to us, uh, well, Can't you at least give me that? I mean, I brought you up, I did my best, and now you are so very bad, poor, uh, poor, pe poor men. So yes, my, my mother uh, was a, a, a punk, and I had to write about her. Um, she was also a very chaotic narrator, and I think I inherited that. If you asked my mother uh, one story, she gave you 50 versions. And I think I had that too. So when she was alive, sometimes she drove me crazy. But once she was dead, I saw that she was an artist. And I had to write about her. Um, my mother was a primitive woman. She didn't care for politics. She didn't know who Franco was or who the monarchy was. She cared about the sea, the sun, the trees, uh, all, all those kinds of things. And that is what I, why I say she's a victory of life. Uh, she barely knew where Barbastro was. Um, so yes, I, I um, grow very passionate when I speak of her. Uh, so that's why I go on and on and on. Um, but I adored her, and my father uh, knew how to annoy me, and that was by saying, uh, you are just like your mother, you, you're very much like her. 
but yes, in the end, I think it's right. Uh, she was an anarchist and I am a literary anarchist. Yeah, yeah, of course. But please speak a little bit about the <laughs> Spanish people as well, because that's really interesting. Could you say some po something positive about the Spanish people as well, maybe? Because if we read your book, they are full of contempt, they hate each other, uh, they laugh at you when you don't speak English and that kind of thing. Is there something positive, anything positive to say about your compatriots? <laughs> todo, todo lo no, 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 es, no, no, sí. <laughs> no, no es, eh, no es así. Eh, la, la, yo creo que es, los, los españoles son maravillosos. Yo lo digo en la, en la siguiente novela, en Alegría. Digo que los españoles son maravillosos, pero históricamente ha habido una eh, una eh, falta de responsabilidad de las élites, ¿no? de las élites españolas a la hora de defender, eh, por lo menos hasta la transición, ¿no? una falta de... de de responsabilidad de las élites a la hora de, de esforzarse por sacar adelante el país entero. ¿no? Eso es lo que yo quería decir. ¿no? No, no los españoles a quienes... Yo soy español y no puedo ser otra cosa que español. Entonces yo amo profundamente a los españoles. Pero sí tengo una desafección histórica hacia las élites españolas. Esto sí. Mm -hmm. well, I could say everything and, um... No, it's not how you describe this. I really believe that um, uh, Spaniards and Spanish people are wonderful. And this is what I describe in Alegría. Nevertheless, um, historically, we see that there is a lack of responsibility uh, uh, from the Spanish elite to try to... Uh, un, uh, until the transition, that is to say, um, they lack this responsibility to try to um, make Spain progress as a whole country. Um, so yes, I am uh, Spanish and I love my country, I love Spain, but I am also uh, very critical of the elite. Uh, me... En mi familia, yo, mis abuelos, yo no sabía ni quiénes eran mis abuelos. O sea, mi padre y mi madre eran como Adán y Eva. Eh, veníamos de la noche de los tiempos. Mi, padre, mi abuelo había sido represaliado por el franquismo y mi otro abuelo se había suicidado. Eh, veníamos de la larga noche de la posguerra española, veníamos del subdesarrollo profundo, eh, de la falta de... de cualquier clase de prosperidad, eh, yo eso lo viví, eh, viví mi familia, yo vengo de la clase media baja española, o sea, es un milagro que yo esté aquí, o sea, es un auténtico milagro, o sea, yo, es un auténtico milagro que yo esté aquí, tendría que estar trabajando en, en el campo, era lo que me estaba destinado, entonces yo soy consciente de mi clase social, soy una conciencia social a, a prueba de bomba, ¿no? Sé de dónde vengo, o sea, yo soy hijo de la miseria, por eso, por eso a, a, a los hijos de la miseria pues nos cualquier cosa nos asusta. Me dicen ahora, ahora te va bien con la literatura, y dices, pero es que me da igual, yo tengo miedo, sigo teniendo el miedo al hambre, yo tengo miedo al hambre. Mi padre pasó hambre, mi padre, mi pa yo, no me, yo, cuando, yo no me dejo nada en el plato porque mi padre, cuando yo era crío y veía que me dejaba una patata frita en el plato, decía, tenía que venir una guerra y yo me asustaba. Y me lo comía todo. O sea, yo soy. Yo he, yo he visto el hambre en España. O sea, he, he visto a los hijos del hambre. Entonces, claro, todo eso es un volumen, un gran saco de, de sensaciones históricas que las llevas encima toda la vida, ¿no? Y, y no sé si somos un país raro, ¿no? Puede que lo seamos, ¿no? Pero, pero tenemos una guerra civil, tenemos 40 años de dictadura. Tenemos todas esas cosas, ¿no? Entonces, uh -huh. por eso escribí yo esto, claro. Uh -huh. um, 
in my family, well, um, I, I didn't even know who my grandparents were. In that sense, my father and mother were like Adam and Eve. Um, I learned, though, that one of my uh, grandfathers uh, went down uh, during uh, the Franquismo, the uh, Franco time, and, and uh, my other grandfather uh, committed suicide. So, yes, we were coming uh, from civil war, from underdevelopment, uh, lack of prosperity, and I lived through that. I saw this. Um, and it's a miracle that I am sitting here. I wasn't supposed to be here at all. I was supposed to be working in the fields. That was my destiny. So yes, I have a very strong developed a social consciousness. And I have seen the children of misery. And I know that the children of misery are afraid most of the times. Uh, we are afraid of, of hunger. My father, he uh, knew what that was to be hungry. So whenever I didn't eat everything from my uh, plate, he said that, well, there has to be a war in order to make you eat everything. And then I, I, I was scared and I ate everything. Um, so yes, I, I know I have seen the children of, of hunger. And we have this massive historical burden that we carry. Maybe we are a strange country, I don't know, but we have seen civil war, we have seen 40 years of dictatorship, so that's what we have. Yeah, that's, that's why what I wrote you're this. That's a writer, probably, yeah. Hay un, un episodio en Alegría, que es la novela que se traduce el año que viene, en, aquí en Podium, en donde cuento que puede servir a esto que me pregunta Margot. Cuento que han, han intentado encontrar los huesos, de los, los restos óseos de Federico García Lorca, que es un poco el símbolo de, de la guerra civil española, y llevan, llevan 10 o 15 años buscando los, lo, el cadáver de Federico García Lorca en distintos enterramientos. Ian Gibson, que es el mayor conocedor, ha dicho varias veces, está aquí, está allí, lo iban buscando por un montón de sitios y no lo encuentran. Entonces yo en alegría digo que no lo encuentran porque Federico García Lorca, cuando ve que lo están buscando, se mueve por la península ibérica y se va a otro sitio. Cuando ve que están los escarbando los, los arqueólogos para encontrarlo, se va. ¿Por qué? Porque él no sabe que los que vienen ahora son amigos. <risa> es lo único que sabe es que en 1936 le pegaron cuatro tiros. ¿no? Y entonces, si alguien que ha sufrido violencia no sabe que los que ahora vienen a por ti ahora son los buenos. No, no lo sabe. Lo único que quiere es que no te encuentren, que no volver a encontrarte. ¿eh? Uh -huh. Esta era la... la la idea que a mí se me ocurrió, digo, joder, digo todos los que este García Lorca no lo encuentran debajo de... No lo, está dando vueltas por la península ibérica y no quiere que lo encuentren los españoles de ahora porque no sabe que estos ahora vienen a amarlo, a quererlo, a, de, a, a, a celebrarlo, a tener devoción hacia él. ¿Cómo va a saber eso? Él se cree que vienen otra vez a por él. Que si vienen otra vez a por él, seguro que vienen a pegarle otros cuatro tiros. Esta era la idea. Uh -huh. There is a, an episode in my novel, Alegría, that uh, is going to be translated for Podium next year. And um, in this episode, I, um, I, I describe something that perhaps answers your question, uh, Margot. And um, it's this, that um, there is an effort of trying to find the remains of Federico García Lorca who is a symbol of the civil, civil war. And they try to find his, his corpse in several places in, in the peninsula. And Gibson, who is the, the main um, connoisseur in, in this field, thinks that he has found Garcia Lorca, but then it appears that no, he hasn't found him. So they go on and go, go on and on. And in my novel, Alegría, I describe this and I say 
that they don't find Garcia Lorca because whenever they are close, he moves and he goes to another uh, place in the peninsula. He just goes away. Why? Because he doesn't know that the ones who are looking for him are friends. He still lives in 1936, uh, uh, where he was shot four times. And uh, it's a way of saying that uh, someone who has experienced violence now doesn't know that the, good, the ones looking for him are the good guys. And uh, that's why he doesn't want to be found. Um, so this, I, I came up with this idea of uh, these people who cannot find uh, Garcia Lorca. Um, and he doesn't know that the people now uh, love him and they are full of adoration uh, for him. Uh, he just thinks, oh, they are coming and they are going to shoot me again four times. Yeah. I have still one question, a f final question. Thank you for this we'll very beautiful anecdote. It's about another writer, actually. It's about Juan Goitisolo. Uh, uh, about whom you write in your book. Um, it's a quite funny episode, actually, because he is uh, uh, in the royal palace uh, receiving the Cervantes Prize with the Queen and the King of Spain. And, um, well, there's, it's a nice image you, you give of him and of the whole ceremony. And now, I, I have met uh, Juan Goiti Solo and I know his work. And... I know that he wrote specially mm -hmm. about um, the woods of literature and the, the tree of writing, because he sees literature as a, as a tree. Uh, uh, it's a kind of genealogy uh, for his. Now, well, I was wondering, why did, did you pick Reutisolo? Were you there, maybe, when the ceremony uh, of the prize was given to him? Or, um, and my second question is, do you see literature like him? Is it a tree for you, and if so, where are the other writers who form the branches? Sí. Bueno, yo era amigo de Juan. Yo era amigo de Juan. Y, y, y Juan era un hombre absolutamente generoso. Eh, fue muy generoso conmigo y con otros escritores españoles jóvenes. ¿no? Eh, y yo le quise mucho a Juan. Eh, eh, aquel día que le dieron el Cervantes, eh, él estaba profundamente incómodo. Eh, no estaba bien, no estaba a gusto en esa situación. Eh, yo como amigo suyo lo vi, vi que, que arrastraba una incomodidad importante. ¿no? Eh, de repente toda la vida escribiendo y, y, y ¿cuál es el pago de un escritor? Pues eh, la representación, el poder oficial, él estaba incómodo en eso. Yo, y yo lo que hice fue reflejar su incomodidad a través de ese... Yo también estaba incómodo por otras razones, ¿no? Yo estaba incómodo porque, porque, porque acababa de morir mi madre, eh, no tenía ninguna... Ni, había dos, dos incomodidades, la de Goitisolo y la mía. A, acababa de morir mi madre, yo no, no tenía ninguna foto de mis abuelos, llego allí al Palacio Real porque me invitan a la entrada del premio Cervantes y, y veo, que, veo, claro, veo que Felipe VI no solo tiene la foto de sus abuelos, sino que tiene a sus tatarabuelos en el Prado pintados por Goya. ¿no? Entonces yo de repente me dije, joder, eres la nada más absoluta. Es decir, debe ser así como funciona la política, es decir, es una familia la que alberga la memoria para simbolizar millones y millones de familias que no sabemos nada de nada, ¿no? Claro, y en torno a la monarquía se construye, se ha construido la, la idea de nación española de la que Juan está siendo víctima ahora porque no le gusta el premio que le están dando, y yo estoy siendo víctima también porque de repente veo que yo no tengo ninguna foto de mis abuelos y este señor las tiene todas, ¿no? Todo eso lo metí en la novela. Uh -huh. me, algunos amigos me dijeron, quita eso, quita eso que no está bien. Otros me dijeron, no, 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 deja eso, deja eso que está muy bien. Uh -huh. es, es la vida. Uh -huh. 
c'est la vie. <rire> Juan was a, a friend of mine and Juan was very generous not only to me but to uh, young uh, um, Spanish authors also and I loved Juan very dearly. Um, about the Cervantes Prize, I uh, know that he was very uncomfortable by it. Uh, he didn't feel right. He was not at ease during that ceremony, and I saw that as a friend. I felt uh, the, his uneasiness. Uh, you spend your whole life writing, and uh, what do you get paid? Uh, a symbolic thing by the power, the representatives of official power. And um, I was also feeling uncomfortable for other reasons, uh, because my mother had died and I didn't even have a photograph of my grandparents. So there were two people there feeling uneasy, uh, Juan and myself. Um, and it was because I saw the king, I saw Felipe and... I thought of the portraits of his great-grandparents uh, painted by Goya and hanging in the Prado Museum and me not having even a photograph of my grandparents. So uh, he, his family uh, symbolizes uh, millions of Spanish families that don't have anything and they have it all. The monarchy is used as an idea of symbolize the Spanish nation. And uh, during that ceremony, uh, Juan and me, we were in some sense victims. Uh, Juan a victim because he didn't like the, the prize and he felt uncomfortable by it. And myself uh, seeing all of this and not having even a photograph of my grandparents. That's why I put it in the novel. Some friends said to me, oh, you have to get it out. It, it's not right. And others said to me, no, you just have to leave it. It's, it's okay. Uh, hay una cosa eh, que eh, Juan Goitisolo era eh, un eh, cervantista, era un cervantino, era, era un amante de Cervantes. Mm -hmm. eh, yo también, en, en el árbol genealógico que tú has que Margot ha dicho. Uh -huh. eh, Cervantes eh, a, a mí me dio una cosa, un bien literario de gran calado, que es la, la ambigüedad en la representación de la vida. Porque eh, muchas personas que han leído Ordesa, en el capítulo referido a la monarquía, hay algunos que me han dicho que si yo soy monárquico, porque han visto que hay en ese capítulo una especie de empatía con la monarquía, ¿no? y otros me han dicho que no. Eso es la ambigüedad cervantina. Eh, la, eh, la misión del escritor no es la de salvar o condenar nada, eh, tal como lo entendió Cervantes, es hacer una foto sobre la realidad y ofrecérsela al lector sin una interpretación. Para que... La foto tiene que ser inteligente y expresiva, pero no debe estar interpretada. Es el lector el que decide qué opción ideológica tomar. ¿no? Eh, de modo que yo allí le represento la sociedad española, la, la política española, pero no hago ni una condena ni una salvación de nada. Es el lector el que debe... De... Eso, es, eso es Cervantes. En el Quijote pasan muchas cosas que, que se les, eh, cuya valoración se le traslada al lector. Es, 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 es la, la tolerancia cervantina. Eh, y la ambigüedad, la tolerancia y la ambigüedad, en el sentido de que cualquier interpretación es válida. Hay episodios en el Quijote de absoluta ambigüedad. La vacía del, del, del barbero que Don Quijote convierte en, en vacillelmo. Todo, en el Quijote todo es una discusión sobre qué estamos viendo. Todos discuten, la, la, gran, la gran innovación de Cervantes es que la realidad es móvil. 
Es, es A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Es un montón de cosas. Esa tolerancia cervantina y esa ambigüedad, para mí, es, es tan en goiti solo. Y, y, yo, y yo, pues creo, en fin, que lo he intentado que estén en Ordesa. Y en este capítulo de la monarquía está la ambigüedad. Um, I would like to add one thing. Uh, Juan Goiti Solo um, was a Cervantista. Um, he adored Cervantes, and uh, I do too. You were speaking of this tree, this uh, genealogical tree, um, and Cervantes also. And I think that what he gave us as a literary asset is ambiguity. Uh, to represent or to express life. Because, um, and I, I tried to do this in uh, Ordesa, in this episode about the monarchy, um, I uh, noticed that some readers said to me, well, you are a monarchist, probably, because they thought I was showing empathy towards monarchy. Other readers said, uh, no, uh, the contrary. And that is uh, the ambigu ambiguity um, by Cervantes. So a writer uh, doesn't have to uh, condemn or judge anything. He just has to take a, phot a photograph of reality and do that as well as, as he can. Uh, but he doesn't have to interpret reality. So this photograph has to be intelligent and expressive, but uh, it, it doesn't have to interpret anything. The reader is the one that has to decide which ideological options he prefers. Um, and what I tried to do is to depict Spain's reality without uh, judging it. That is what Cervantes is all about. And that is what you also see in Quixote, uh, his tolerance and his ambiguity. Um, each interpretation is also valid. And um, everything uh, that's also by Cervantes, uh, it's really a discussion of everything we see. So reality is something that moves. It can be A, B, C, D or G. Um, and this is also what I tried to express in that episode in Ordesa about the monarchy. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for having Thank us. You, Margot. Been Thank you, with us. Thank you very much, Leticia. And I think uh, Marek Trulstra of the OBA would like to speak and say the final word. Yes. Thank you very much for being with us on behalf of the Public Library of Amsterdam. I really enjoyed your uh, talk and we really got an insight into your work. Thank you very much for that. I think everybody who didn't read Ordesa yet will do that right now under the Christmas tree probably. I will anyway. And we are all looking forward to the translation by Terijne. Thank you very much also for joining us, Terijne, in Brussels. Uh, we are all looking forward to your translation of uh, Alegria as well. Thank you very much. I brought you a little uh, present from Amsterdam to remind you of your visit. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And also a big thank you, of course, to my go Dijkgraaf. I can't ask for a, a big applause, although we can. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Margot. Thank you, thank you very much. Trine, thank you very much. And also a big thank you to uh, Instituto Cervantes. I didn't, ask, uh, didn't say uh, Pilar Tena, the director of uh, Instituto Cervantes, introduced this afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, Manuel Villas to Amsterdam. Thank you very much. And also to the publisher, Podium, thank you very much for joining us as well. Um, this was the start of a series. We didn't mention that before. This was the start of a series in which Instituto Cervantes and the Public Library of Amsterdam will invite some Spanish authors. So if you enjoyed this, please follow us on our, in our agenda. We will meet again on the 25th of January. See you then and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs>